priestesses of fire and water deal damage with divine dances in today's video. Hello everyone, Golden Nova here, and it's time to cover the new releases from one of my favorite types of sets, deck build packs. Smaller sets that introduce three new archetypes into the game, with a focused set of reprints to make sure some of the essentials are readily available. For the next few episodes, we'll be covering these new themes starting with Mikanko, a series that takes a lot of aesthetic cues from Shintoism. Each of them is a priestess modeled after, or are perhaps avatars of the power of the goddess Amaterasu and her descendants. But what does the deck do mechanically? Well, you'll just have to stick around to find out. We'll observe the delightful dances of these powerful priestesses, see how they utilize the sacred treasures to the fullest, then find some outside inspiration for our routine. Let's work up a sweat with Mikonkos. But before we continue, a quick reminder to please like and subscribe if you've enjoyed my content so far. We're on the road to 100,000 subscribers, and there's no better way to get there than on our Duel Runners. Our next stop is 40k, which means Leo and Luna Explained, where we'll be covering Ancient Fairy Dragon's Companions, the Power Tool Dragons, Morphtronics, and any other cards that are more than meets the eye. We've also got our Discord, where Masquerade, the Crimson Gleam Dragon, has been given just the best nicknames. I also have a Twitch where you can join me for viewer duels, progression polls polls, and chaos draft polls for the foreseeable future. And don't forget about my Patreon, where you can gain access to my videos early, reach some of these milestones, as well as helping to determine which videos I make. Thank you all so much for watching, and now, back to the video. So what's the deal with Makonkos? Well, they're a series of monsters with zero attack and defense that look to take the attack reflection mechanic to a whole other level. If you're familiar with Amazonas Swordswoman or Digustos Freeze, you've seen that some cards actually like to run into bigger monsters because they take all the battle damage you would have taken and give it all to your opponent instead. All of Army Conco monsters do this one way or another, with equip spells being a major factor in enabling these effects. Let's start things off by talking about Hare, the Sword Mikanko, a level 3 Fire Warrior monster, and if this card is not equipped with an equipped card, you take no battle damage from battles involving it. If it is equipped with an equipped card, it can be destroyed by battle, also your opponent takes any battle damage you would have taken from battles involving it instead. And if this card becomes equipped with an equipped card, you can add a Mikanko equip spell from your deck to your hand. However, this does not have to be equipped with a Makonko equip spell to trigger that search. So while you're incentivized to play the on-theme ones, don't be afraid to dabble in others for more utility. And while I usually leave this kind of clarification to the on-screen text, this effect is a hard once per turn, so don't think you can go equipping multiple cards to stack that effect. But since it's a trigger, if you have ways to quick effect equip Hare on your opponent's turn, of which there are plenty, you'll be able to accrue advantage very quickly so you can keep up in the rat race. Nini, the Mirror Mikanko, is a level 3 water spellcaster monster that's very similar to Hare. Nini also prevents you from taking damage in battles involving it if it's not equipped, can be destroyed by battle, and reflects battle damage when equipped, but it lacks Hare's search. Instead, if equipped, then during your opponent's turn as a quick effect, you can target a face-up monster your opponent controls and take control of it until the end phase. This will keep your opponent from utilizing a monster that would be problematic for you to deal with otherwise, or to keep them off their game plan. For instance, if your opponent uses Sprite Starter, then you can steal away the summoned monster before they can special summon the level 2s from hand, forcing your opponent to commit other level 2s to the board by some means to get their plays online. Similarly, you can steal key material for extra deck summons, or even use your opponent's monster's effects if they're quick ones. Using those monsters as material for your own summons might be tough, but with IP Mask Arena, it's not impossible. Basically, you'll be using Nini to bat around your opponent's field to keep them just far enough away from their game plan so you can punish them for it later, making your matches a game of cat and mouse. Mikanko of Uhime is a level 6 Light Fairy Ritual monster that can be ritual summoned with Mikanko Kagura. That's right, strap in everyone, because this deck has a little bit of ritual flavoring. Which is odd, since most decks that have rituals either make it their whole thing, or is kind of an obligatory inclusion to fit alongside a wide variety of extra deck cards. Anyway, this card can't be destroyed by battle, and your opponent takes any battle damage from battles involving this card. So basically, it's our previous Mikonko's effects when they have equipped cards, but Uhime just has it all the time, no matter what. 
You can reveal this card from your hand to add any Makonko card from your deck to your hand, then discard a card. So it's kind of like the best parts of Illusion of Chaos mixed with the best parts of Fateful Adventure. I dig. And as a quick effect while on the field, you can target an equip spell in your grave and equip it to any appropriate monster on the field. And note that this can be equipped to any monster on the field, so not only can you get back beneficial cards for you, on top of enabling Nini and Hare's effects, but detrimental cards for your opponent. So, on top of being another fantastic member of the team when it comes to pushing for reflected damage, Uhime really does help the rest of the theme sunshine. But what about that ritual spell? Well, Mikanko Kagura lets you ritual summon any Mikanko ritual monster, so look out for more of those in the future, and can use material from your hand or field whose levels equal or exceed the level of the ritual monster you're looking to summon, so you don't have to sweat the exacts. What's bonkers here is that, afterwards, this applies an additional effect that destroys cards your opponent controls up to the number of equip spells with different names in your grave, and if you do, burn your opponent for a thousand damage for each card destroyed. So that's a non-targeting piece of mass removal that's super searchable and cleaves your opponent's life points in twain. Yeah, uh, sorry Nephthys, if you didn't already feel outdated on release, I can't imagine how you're feeling right now. And you're the fire deck, so at the very least you should have been better at burning. The Great Makonko of Legend is a quick play spell that can special summon any Makonko monster from your hand, ignoring summoning conditions, but it's returned to the hand during your opponent's end phase. And during your main phase, you can banish this card from the grave to send any Makonko card from your deck to the grave. Now, this isn't super good to pair with your regular Makonkos, because you'll lose all the equips on them when they get sent back to the hand. But this works phenomenally well with Uhime. Great Makonko's second effect doesn't have a turn delay, so you can use this to summon Uhime without having to tribute for it, send a Makonko equip spell from your deck to the grave, then equip it to one of your other Makonkos using Uhime's effect, with the bonus of getting to bring back another equip card during your opponent's turn before the Sun Goddess rises back to your hand. However, if you need to push for a little extra damage, using this to summon more Makonkos is a fine option, because you don't have to worry about the downsides if you just win the duel before that, which is part of why it's so great. Doorway of the Celestial Makonko is a field spell, and while you control any monsters equipped with an equipped card, your opponent must attack them if able. And if your Makonko monsters battle, your opponent can't activate cards or effects until the end of the damage step. And if your Makonko monster attacks at the end of the damage step, you can send an equipped card you control to the grave, and that monster can make another attack on a monster in a row. And that's not once per turn. So if you can load up on equips, you can keep running into monsters over and over again for massive damage. And that's just what you get to take advantage of on your turn. Your opponent will need to make sure they break your setup before going to the battle phase, because otherwise they're going to take some massive damage, and a bonus is that this card draws fire away from your non-equipped monsters in case you need it. And of course, tacking on the Armade's Claws is a nice touch. But I feel like this is more of a stairway and not a doorway, we've gotta work on our terminology. Alright, now we can get into the equip spells. Arabesque of the Makonko keeps the equipped monster from being destroyed by card effects, and during your main phase, you can special summon a Makonko monster from your hand or deck with a different original name than the equipped monster, and if you do, equip it with this card then return the monster that was equipped with this card to the hand. Thankfully, this doesn't just have to be equipped to a Makonko, so any monster can benefit from the effect Destruction Protection, and pairs very nicely with the Makonko's on-board Battle Destruction Immunity. In fact, this is a very strong tool for splashing in other archetypes that have great normal summons. You get whatever benefits they confer, then you can use Arabesque to bounce it back whenever deploying either Hare or Nini, your choice. Then next turn, you can normal summon them again for more value, really helping your deck flow. You know, like water. Blazing Dance of the Makonko also keeps the equipped monster from being destroyed by card effect, and it special summons a Makonko from your hand or grave, equip it with this card, then you can special summon a monster from your opponent's grave to their field, but negate its effects. This card bypasses a few of the main issues when it comes to damage reflection strategies, making sure your opponent has the right monster for you to punish, as well as ensuring their effects aren't a threat. Blazing Dance fixes both of those by picking whatever monster you want out of your opponent's grave, and negating its effects, so it really just becomes a big vanilla. Kaijus used to fill this kind of functionality, and while I still feel like they have a place in a deck like this, relying solely on them can be kinda bricky. Blazing Dance is a searchable option you can use to get the job done basically all by itself, which makes this card a hot commodity. 
Purifying Dance of the Makonko is the third equip spell that keeps the equipped monster from being destroyed by card effects, but this one can only be equipped to a Makonko monster. And if a monster is special summoned to your opponent's field, except during the damage step, you can target a monster you control and a monster your opponent controls and return them to the hand. So while you can only equip this to an on-theme monster, it can bounce any monster you have. So the ability to potentially recycle your normal summons is still there. One might ask why you'd want to bounce monsters when the whole point is that you want your opponent to have monsters so you can run into them, but sometimes your opponent will land a very unfortunate answer that you just can't wait on, so Purifying Dance helps to keep them from being a problem. It also doesn't have to bounce what was summoned, the special summoning is just the trigger. And since it doesn't specify who does the special summoning, you can actually pull this off on your own terms with, surprise surprise, Kaijus, letting you bounce that big chonker back to the hand, or bouncing an accompanying monster as a nice two-for-one. Which, in Yu-Gi-Oh math, is pure value. Inviting Rondo of the Makonko is the first one that does not provide effect destruction protection, which is why I had to keep mentioning it. You can equip it only to an opponent's monster, and you take control of it while you control a Makonko monster, and it can't activate its effects while on the field while you control it. And when this card leaves the field, send the equipped monster to the grave. So even if you don't take it, removing Rondo is still monster removal. That's fantastic. And while you can't use its effects, you can attack with it, as well as leveraging it for extra deck material, or even ritual fodder if it's not an Xyz or Link. I'm sure there's a lot more going on here than just being an archetypal snatch deal, but those insights are beyond the scope of this video, and I invite you to share your ideas in the comments below. Alright, that does it for the equip spells, now it's time for a few trap cards, something I did not think I would have to cover in a ritual equip theme. Mikanko Catfight is a normal trap card that you can activate if you control a Mikanko monster. You target a face-up monster on the field and equip it with an appropriate equip spell from your deck, and if any equip spells are sent to your grave while this card is in the grave, you can banish this card, then target an equip spell in your grave and add it to your hand. This is wild. It's basically Armory Call, but you can equip to either player's monsters, which, let me tell you, is going to be very relevant very soon. You can steal with Inviting Rondo, or prep a Compulse with Purifying Dance. And it recycles your equip spells! And since it doesn't care how it ended up in the grave, Foolish Burial Goods makes for a great enabler. You can either use it to send Catfight to the grave, or send any equip from your deck to the grave while Catfight is in the grave to get things started. It also leans on the mythology to make the cat versus rat joke that y'all know I'm here for. Mikanko Promise is a normal trap card that special summons a Mikanko monster from your hand or deck, but banish it when it leaves the field. Then you can equip it with one appropriate equip spell from your hand or grave. This is a pretty neat recovery tool that gets you a fresh Mikanko and an equip to make it online, and while not being a spell makes it a little slow, it's still hella useful on your opponent's turn. There is the downside of losing the monster to the banished zone if you lose them, but to be fair, you're probably running three copies of each, so you can spare one or two. Besides, no matter how far away they are, the Mikankos will always find a way back to each other, and that's a promise. Alright, that's all the Mikanko cards, but what do we do with them? Well, reverse OTKing our opponent is the name of the game. In fact, I'd say it's the reason you're playing the deck in the first place, so we want to play as many cards as we can to help us achieve that goal. So what can we play to help them out? First, let's identify what equip spells will complement our existing arsenal. And to start, let's check out the reprints that Amazing Defenders has to offer. While the Infernoble cards, Durandal and Renaud, are pretty neat, they only work specifically with Hare and not Nini or Uhime, so things can get a little lopsided. Hidden Armory works very well with Blazing Dance, as it works around that pesky normal summon restriction, but the absolute goat of the pack is Double-Edged Sword, which is arguably your win condition. But not because you're equipping it to your Makankos, rather because you're equipping it to your opponent. Opponent's monster. If we slap it onto anything with 2,000 or more attack, they'll be at 4,000. So if we run smack dab into that monster with our own Makanko, with the damage reflection active for our non rituals, of course, both of us and our opponent will take 4,000. Which is a complete lie because our opponent is the one taking all of our damage. That's right, it is a very, very simple OTK, and making sure this simple interaction goes through is a must. And bonus, if you ever have to do this by equipping to a smaller monster and not causing an auto kill, since you don't take any damage, double-edged sword self-destruction effect will basically never come into play. 
For some less, um, decisive options though, Acts of Fools boosts an opponent's monster while negating its effects and burns your opponent for a bit of damage each turn. Mage Power can be equipped to an opponent's monster to give him a huge potential boost with all of our equips. Mord Schlag will keep your Mikonkos from being affected by Special Summoned Monsters activated effects, though make sure the Mikonko you want to use it with wasn't Special Summoned. Super Magic Sword Raptinus can provide targeting protection as well as additional normal summons, but the best ones are probably the Bamboo Sword Package, as playing them will allow you access to the Golden Bamboo Sword Draw Engine. In fact, another really good card to help with equip decks, especially ones that use warriors, is Isolde, Two Tales of the Noble Knights. While searching out Hare precludes us from using them that turn, I'm sure there are other warriors you can take advantage of. In the meantime, its ability to mill three equips from the deck to summon Hare is great, as you now have a good bank of cards to not only retrieve with other effects, you can send Cursed Bamboo Sword to search your other Bamboo Sword cards. And the more you mill, the stronger your ritual spell will be when it resolves, letting you pop more cards and deal more burn damage. And since Esold is so important, we'll want to be running one card Esold engines, and Neospace Connector remains one of the best, partly because you can use the Aqua Dolphin you summon as a way to check your opponent's hand and rip a hand trap or other low attack monster out. Hey, a bit of an awkward edit here, but um, I came to this realization after everything was edited, and I've got a feeling I'll catch some flack if I don't include this. But as long as we're playing Isold, we might as well search out Immortal Phoenix Gearfried. Uh, we can't use it the turn we search it, obviously, but we are a deck that is chock full of equip spells, so it's easy to field, has great negation, and if your opponent isn't giving you anything to reflect damage on, well, 3000's a great way to go in for game. And of course, with Yu-Gi-Oh being the way it is, we've got to go over what floodgates work best with us. Hey, hey, I'm sorry I don't make the ban list, I just play under it. Now, a lot of them don't fly with us, as we have a variety of types and attributes, but that means we work just fine with there can be only one. Summon Limit is also potentially very strong, but the one I want to try out is Lose One Turn. Just because we can Special Summon it doesn't mean it's integral to our game plan, and this card is huge. So many decks immediately lose out to having their on-field effects negated, even for a turn. Like, yeah, your opponent can still turbo out a bunch of sprites, but what are they going to do with them? Make Gigantic? And what are they going to do with that? Yeah, that's what I thought. And of course, we can't forget our Rituals. Though, to be honest, it's not really the core of our deck, so I'd recommend running Preparation of Rites to search Uhime as needed, and maybe recur the Ritual spell if we have one in Grave. Since we aren't at, like, a critical mass of Rituals, adding anything like Incantations or Drytron isn't really necessary. We've already gone over how useful Kaijus can be earlier, but it's worth reiterating here. If our opponent has monsters with Omni Negates, they aren't going to just let us set up in their face, so having a way to out them is imperative. But with how large boards can get, we might actually want to consider branching away from Kaijus and using Lava Golem instead. This takes out two cards at the cost of our normal summon, but as we stated previously, we don't necessarily need that, so long as we have the right equip spells. And bonus, if you get your opponent to just slightly under lethal, say a thousand points, Lava Golem will clean things up for you on their turn. And speaking of not needing our normal summon, the Adventure Engine! Now, you can plug this into a lot of things, but I like it most when it's used not just as a free negate. And the equip theming is actually relevant to Mikonkos. Specifically, when Gateway of the Celestial Mikonko sends an equip card to the grave, you can send an adventure equip card to the grave, which can return back to the field once per turn for a free attack. As for a silly tech pick, how about giving Sky Striker Mecha Module's multi roll a try? Despite being able to win in battle very easily, you do need to resolve at least some equip spells to make it work. But once your opponent is wise to their tricks, they're not likely to allow you to equip a double-edged sword to their monster. But if you make it so your opponent can't respond to spell card activations, then all bets are off. And this leaves the window open to running a small Sky Striker engine to search this out, while adding a little bit of extra utility. And that's all I have to say about Mikanko. Honestly, I see this deck getting very big very soon. All you have to do is land a couple of equipped spells, go to the battle phase, and it's all over. And since the deck basically has its own illusion of chaos, you not only have a consistent engine, but one compact enough to fit in with other themes that can handle the control while you handle the clobbering. Some naysayers might not like how gimmicky the wind condition is, and will say it's not going to stick the landing, but remember, there are Mikankos, not Mikantkos. But now, I want to hear what you all have to say. 
Are Mikonkos equipped to handle the format ahead, or are they burdened with two left feet? Let me know in the comments, and if you haven't already, please make sure to like this video and subscribe to show your support, ring that bell so you don't miss an episode, and share this video with someone you know who loves Yu-Gi-Oh! It really does a lot to help me out. Today's episode was brought to you by my lovely patrons, including Quasar Commander Harry, the ominous benefactor, special contributor Gibbles the Gibble, Nebula Navigators Third Dynasty, Adam Zagdell, Ashling Waltz, Avi Chali, Benjamin Meisner, Cameron Berg, Cryptic Gamer, Eric, Frankie, Genesis Yu-Gi-Oh, Gloomba331, Great Big Pillock, Howling Zangetsu, Inblink, Ironic, John Manji, Julius Sneezer, Larakia, Meteornis, Michael Madsen, Mighty Action X, Muzuki Clark, Neo Trinity, Panther J, Rebel King Lucifer, RJ the Jank Monarch, Ruxeth Sarani, The Fresh Prince of Conair, The Wizard Moose, True Neutral, Tyler Cranston and Xander Wolfensberger, Cosmic Crusaders, Bear Shark to Puss Studios, Jazz Ghost, Corbinisms, Cozy Boat 275, Jesus Garcia, KL, KL the Dragon, Manga Pages, Marion James E. Picotta, Nitromo, RGS, Rem T. Bright, Shooting Star 3300, Star Lord 777, Tyler Martin and the Legendary Raven, as well as the lovely Starlight Explorers you see on screen now. I'm only able to continue doing this thanks to the support of these lovely people, so if you'd like to be a part of these credits as well as help me in my journey to cover all of Yu-Gi-Oh!'s archetypes, please check out my YouTube membership or Patreon links in the description to see if I have anything you'd like on offer. And if you'd like to see another video about ritual monsters that are very steeped in mythological iconography, check out this video I did covering Shinobirds. And if you want to see two Yu-Gi-Tubers going at it, check out Noah Jenk and I's latest series progression polls, where your voice shapes the format. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye bye